Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D, I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight in the game. So today's suggestion comes in from my partner actually, who's basically responsible for the whole idea of Monster Mondays as I do them. She suggested this so you have her to thank for it. So she's really overdue for getting her own suggestion and she'd really like to see liches. So what is a lich? Well for that I'm going to turn to the 5e monster manual because it's a really lovely description, or really chilling description I guess, but it's very well written. It describes liches as follows. Liches are the remains of great wizards who embrace undeath as a means of preserving themselves. They further their own power at any cost, having no interest in the affairs of the living, except where those affairs interfere with their own. Scheming and insane, they hunger for long forgotten knowledge and the most terrible secrets. Because the shadow of death doesn't hang over them, they can conceive plans that take years, decades, or centuries to come to fruition. A lich is a gaunt and skeletal humanoid with withered flesh stretching tight across its bones. Its eyes succumb to decay long ago, but points of light burn in its empty sockets. It's often garbed in the mouldering remains of fine clothing and jewellery worn and dulled by the passage of time. It's hard to sum up liches better than that. But if you still don't have a really clear picture in your mind, just imagine Voldemort from the Harry Potter series and you're on the right track. Liches are incredibly iconic villains, so much so that they've entrenched themselves in popular media. Outside of D&D, they also appear in Adventure Time, cartoon very much inspired by D&D adventures, Dota 2 is apparently a character, World of Warcraft and the entire Warcraft game series feature a lot of liches, Elder Scrolls series, there are even similar creatures. In things like the Lord of the Rings, we have the Nazgul in Lord of the Rings, Wraiths, Whites, just to name a few. But where did they come from? Who came up with this first? Well, much to my surprise, they weren't part of ancient folklore or some sort of myth or legend. Their name is drawn from Old English though, Lich, meaning corpse. In England, we also have things called Lich Gates, L-Y-C-H, Gates, which are basically roofed entrances or gateways to church grounds and graveyards. They basically symbolically represent a passage into death when a body would be carried through that threshold. But I was wrong, there were no mentions of liches, as we understand them at least, being mentioned or part of the general consciousness before Clark Ashton Smith and Robert E. Howard, two writers in the early 1900s, started writing stories about powerful magic that could return sorcerers from the dead. In fact, it was really D&D that crystallised the whole concept of a lich, transformed a lot of pervasive cultural ideas, as I say, like mummies and whites and wraiths and the Grim Reaper, all this kind of stuff, and congealed them together to become what we would now know as a lich. Gary Gygax claims that when he created the modern lich as we understand it, he took particular inspiration from Gardner Fox's 1969 short story, The Sword of the Sorcerer. Now, if, like me, Gardner Fox's name sounds familiar, but you can't quite place it, you don't totally know where you've heard that name before, it might help to know that he was the co-creator of DC Comics' The Flash, Hawkman, Doctor Fate, and the whole idea of DC Comics' multiverse. He was a writer for DC Comics. There, hopefully I've alleviated you of a burden there, if you couldn't quite place it. Now, I've often thought of homebrewing a lich class, or a prestige class, in 5th edition. I may still do it, because at the end of the day, liches are essentially just wizards or sorcerers, or according to the 1975 Greyhawk supplement where they were introduced, a cleric who has decided to unnaturally extend their lives beyond what is possible for a mortal, so you just need to technically be a spellcaster of some kind who chooses not to die, right? Well, I mean, yes and no. I may still make a class like this, but it doesn't totally do liches justice. In D&D, they're one of the most fearsome and terrifying creatures that your party can face. They're a challenge rating 21 creature, or, or 22 if you choose to fight them in their lair, which might take the form of an ancient tomb or a frostbitten wizard's tower, or in the case of World of Warcraft, a floating necropolis spewing green toxic ooze from the sky. In order to become a lich, a person has to embark on a lengthy and dark ritual that often involves a pact made with some unholy deity or cunning and evil devil, and it culminates in them creating something called a phylactery. For those unfamiliar, a phylactery means to guard and protect in ancient Greek. 
It's a small container which can be seen in modern day in the form of the tefillin, the version of a phylactery used in modern Orthodox Judaism, which contains scrolls of parchment from the Torah which is used during special prayers. For a lich though, a phylactery is still a container, although it need not look like one. In the case of Voldemort, for example, a phylactery can look like just about anything, and the same is the case in D&D. For a lich, a phylactery is an object which binds their soul to the land of the living, keeping them unnaturally tied to life. If they're ever killed or destroyed, a new, fully functioning body will spawn within five feet of their phylactery within 1d10 days ready to strike back at those that caused them harm in the past. As their lives are tied to their phylacteries, liches often go to great lengths to hide them, to sequester them away in trap-laden dungeons, or to discreetly and inconspicuously put them somewhere that they will draw very little attention. Although liches can do whatever they like with their eternal lives, they are locked to an evil alignment, regardless of whether they choose to help their mortal kin, because their phylacteries are a dark and very hungering object that requires regular soul sacrifices to maintain its power. Liches perform a special version of the spell Imprisonment, which featured in my Top 5 Fates Worse Than Death video. But in this version of the spell, a lich finds one person every once in a while and traps their soul inside the phylactery. Now, a successful Dispel Magic spell cast at a ninth level can free an imprisoned creature, but failure to do so within 24 hours results in the phylactery consuming the soul trapped within, destroying it irreparably, and this adds the lifespan of that creature to the unnatural life of the lich. Now if a lich truly wants to benefit other people, and doesn't want to perform this ritual, or maybe they forget to feed the phylactery souls, or they're forced not to because they're imprisoned in a way that they can't escape, or if the phylactery is somehow destroyed and they can't fuel it any longer, this may result after a period of time in the lich slowly weakening, gradually becoming what's called a demi-lich. Some choose to become demi-liches if they exhaust the potential for knowledge in the physical plane, transfer their consciousness via astral projection across the many planes of existence, leaving their body to decay and their phylactery behind to rot until their putrid body desiccates and only a skull and a pile of bones remain. That said, demi-liches are still full of magical power, and although they're only a shadow of their former lich selves, with a challenge rating of 18, they're nothing to sniff at. They have more than enough power to take on most adventurers that seek to destroy them. Fighting a lich at full strength, however, is pretty much suicidal. They have a fairly low AC at 17, but make up for that in being resistant to cold, paladins, or clerics' ability to turn undead, lightning damage, necrotic damage, they're immune to poison and being poisoned, and they're immune to damage of any kind from mundane weapons, i.e. those that aren't magical, they're immune to being charmed, they're immune to being exhausted, frightened, or paralyzed. On top of which, three times per day, they can just choose to succeed on a saving throw that they've already failed. They have true sight up to 120 feet, so no invisible or illusory magic, no cunning, no powers that rely on sight. I mean, they can even see into the ethereal plane with this. Nothing will really get past them. And then on top of that, they're an 18th level spellcaster with access to spells like Power Word Kill, Dominate Monster, Finger of Death, Disintegrate, and animate dead to name but a few. But wait, there's more. If they're having trouble with someone in close quarters combat, they can also prod them. They have an icy cold touch, as frozen as their lifeless hearts, which deals 3d6 cold damage and causes players to become paralyzed for one minute if they fail a constitution check, constitution saving throw. And then they have legendary actions on top of all of that. Now I've touched on legendary actions before, I think when I was talking about vampires. But if you missed that Monster Monday, and you're predominantly a player who's not really experienced the DM side of things and you don't know what legendary actions are, but well, they're actions that certain legendary creatures can take out of turn order. In the Lich's case, it gets three of them per round, and it can do any of the following things at the end of another creature's turn. It can cast one of its many cantrips, it can use that paralyzing touch ability, it can force someone to make a wisdom saving throw or become frightened for a whole minute, or it can send out a wave of necrotic energy that draws the life from its foes. Which means if they fail a constitution saving throw, they take 66 necrotic damage. So they're very, very strong. But if that isn't Dark Souls enough for you, if you think that's still too easy, 
you can always confront a lich in its own lair, in its own home, which point becomes drastically more powerful. In its lair, it can draw upon the latent magic that it's imbued in its home and cause lair actions to manifest at initiative 20, once per turn, but it's still out of outside of its turn order. So initiative 20, this happens, and then it gets to make its legendary actions whenever it wants to, and it has its own turn. On the upside, it can't use the same lair action twice in a row, but it does get to do it every single turn. It can do the following things. It can choose to roll a d8, at which point it regains a spell slot of that level or lower. It can unnaturally chain or tether another creature that it can see within 30 feet with a crackling cord of negative energy. This means until the start of the next turn, whenever the Lich takes damage, its tethered target needs to make a constitution saving throw, and if it fails, the Lich only takes half damage and the rest goes to this unfortunate tethered character. And finally, you can conjure the spirits of the many, many people who have tried to kill it before in its own lair, calling forth apparitions, ghosts basically, to attack one creature within 60 feet of the Lich. The target can make a constitution saving throw, but if it fails, it takes 15 d6 necrotic damage as they are swarmed and obliterated by legions of spirits, and on a success, they still take half as much, after which point the apparitions disappear, but it's only two turns before it can do that again if it wants to. So liches are an absolute party killer. I mean, not that they're not fun to hang out with. I'm sure they're not as well, but that's not what I meant. They are a team killer. They are very, very powerful. A really, really cool monster. So this has been great fun to draw. If you have any suggestions of creatures that you'd like to see, I'm compiling a little list and trying to get through them in order of when people suggested them to me. So make sure to leave your suggestion down in the comments below so that I can get around to drawing a monster of your suggestion. And if you like these videos, you like the content that I make and you want to help support me as I carry on making content, please make sure to leave a little thumbs up, leave a like down below, maybe favorite this video and share it with someone who you think might enjoy learning about liches. It really massively helps us out. So thank you very much for that. In the meantime, thank you for joining me. Happy monster hunting and I'll see you next time.